Okay, we have the upcoming festival of Purim upon us in a couple of days. And of course, on Purim, we read the book of Esther, which details the story of the Purim miracle. Of course, the Jews are in Persia, and there's the King Achashverosh, which in the third year of his reign, he makes a big banquet. The Jewish people attend the banquet. There is a dramatic encounter between Achashverosh and his queen, Esther, and his queen Vashti, and she is executed. And he's looking for a replacement, and the king coronates the mysterious and taciturn Esther, who is a Jewess, but doesn't reveal that. Mordechai, Mordechai foils an assassination attempt against the king. Haman is appointed as prime minister. Mordechai refuses to bow before him. It's beneath Haman to avenge his honor by killing just Mordechai. And he says, I want to destroy the entire nation. He petitions the king for permission to destroy the Jewish people. And the king says, yeah, you'll do it. And I'm not even going to take charge of any money for it. You keep your money. And he sends out these irreversible letters throughout the kingdom that it's going to be free reign to commit genocide and exterminate the Jews on the 13th day of Adar in a couple of months. And Mordechai finds out about this. And he tells Esther, you have been placed in the halls of power for this reason to stop this decree. So she invites Haman and Ahasuerus for one party. Haman is all excited that he's been invited to the queen's party. When he leaves, he sees Mordechai bowing to him. He says, okay, I got to make a gala. I can't wait till the 13th day of Adar. He comes back to the king and the king was having a bad dream. And the king feels like there is an assassination attempt against him. And he says, well, maybe I didn't honor someone who did something good to me. And that's why no one's revealing it to me. And Haman is asked for his counsel, what to do with the person who the king wants to honor. Haman, of course, thinks it's referring to him. So he, so he devises this very uh, uh, dramatic honor to be bestowed upon this person. It turns out that that's Mordechai. So he has to parade his nemesis, Mordechai, throughout the town. And then by the second banquet, Esther reveals that she's a Jewess and she just wants her life and the life of her people in exchange uh, in, as a request from the king. Who's the one who wants to destroy your, who is the one who wants to destroy your people? It's this guy. It's Haman. And Haman, in fact, wants to make this gallows to hang Mordechai, who saved the king. And the king says, okay, you hang him on those gallows. The king issues a new decree on the 13th day of Adar, the day that was destined for the Jewish people being destroyed. This day, they're allowed to kill their enemies. And indeed, they do kill their enemies. And then on the 14th day, they have another round of that. And finally, there is peace and stability. And in the aftermath of this story, at least according to one opinion, Darius, who is the son of Esther, he signs off on the order to allow the completion of the construction of the temple. As a result of this miracle, that the awful day was turned into a delightful day, the sages enacted the festival of Purim, and there are four myths that we do on that day. We read the Megillah, which is the story that details what happened. We give gifts to the poor. We send food to our neighbors. And finally, we eat a festive banquet. That is the story, roughly, as we know it. Today, I want to do something a little bit different with this story. Our sages tell us that the book of Esther is very expoundable. And of course, in general, the Torah is multidimensional. Every verse in the Torah, every verse in Scripture could be understood at least on 70 different levels. Talmud says that studying Torah is comparable to taking a hammer and shattering a rock. There are shards that go flying in every direction. Torah is multidimensional. You can see from many different angles. Moreover, we're told that all of Torah can be understood on, on four different spheres. There's the pshat, the simple interpretation, and then there are more and more esoteric dimensions until you reach the level of sod, meaning the secret level, the Kabbalistic level, where it's entirely a secret. If y'all remember, a couple of years ago, we started the book of Jonah, and we said, let's do the book of Jonah, not on the simple level, but on a deeper level. 
and we followed the teachings of the Gona Vilna, who wrote a commentary on the level of remis, on the level of allegory on the book of Jonah, where Jonah was the soul and the soul was given a mission and the soul failed in the mission, the soul was given a second chance, but had to deal with the consequences of being reincarnated. He writes a commentary of the book of Esther on the book of Esther, also on the allegorical level. Maybe it's a little bit less dramatic than his commentary on the book of Jonah, you be the judge. But he writes this magisterial commentary explaining the Megilla, both on a simple level, shot, simple understanding, and on, and on an allegorical level as well. And what I found while studying it is that it contains lots of valuable lessons and it's very Kabbalistic. So we have to accept that some things we're not gonna understand perfectly. I of course hereby freely admit that much of what we're talking about is really above me. Nevertheless, we're gonna share it as best as we can. I tried to follow all the sources. I tried to follow all the breadcrumbs and find the Talmud that he's mentioning and find all the Zohars that he's quoting it's not so easy because he quotes sources with one or two words, and you don't know, is that a verse in Proverbs? Is that a verse in Jeremiah? Is that some sort of teaching from the Zohar? So I did a lot of Googling to try to find all these sources. It wasn't so easy, but still what emerges is a total uh, fascinating approach to the level of remis, the level of allegory of this book. And I also think it shows the otherworldly command over all areas of Torah that the Gona Vilna had. Of course, we talk about the Gona Vilna as this total legend, but when you read his commentary on this book, you see just the genius of being able to explain the exact same words on a simple level, where there are people, and there's a king, and there's a banquet, and there's a challenge, and there's a conflict, and there's the attempted at genocide. And then that same exact story, each one of those characters is an allegory, is a reference to some other idea and some other component. And that also has a conflict and a story and a challenge and, uh, and things that need to be accomplished. And I, I, found, I found it uh, completely fascinating. And I also feel like it shows the, the brilliance and the strata of, of scripture where you're reading one thing and you see the various layers before you, I found that fascinating. Now what's particularly interesting, now what's particularly interesting about this book or this commentary vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say his commentary on Jonah, is that he's, an, he's essentially extending this principle that everything in Torah has multiple layers. He's extending it, not just the scripture itself, but to the Talmud. So for example, if there is a, a verse that the Talmud explains what the verse means, he explains the Talmud also on the simple level and on the allegorical level. So this commentary is going to follow both scripture and the Talmudic interpretation of that scripture and explain the allegory that's found both in the scripture and in the Talmud. Now it's not what, now this commentary in effect is not really about the story of Esther or the story of Purim per se, but I think when we finish it, we will see how the lessons of Esther and the lessons of Purim are indeed manifest on the simple level in the story and also on the allegorical level with the various lessons that emerge. So with that introduction, let us begin. He tells us that on the level of Remes, on the level of allegory, this story or this book is hinting on the life of a man and the struggles that the man has with the Yetzirah, with the evil inclination, and the accusations of the Satan and ultimately the downfall of the Satan when man is able to overcome man's challenges. Now he begins with a Midrash. The Midrash says as follows. In the book of Esther, the name of God does not appear even once. It's talking about the king. Which king? King Ahasuerus, the king of the world, essentially, of Persia, from Hodu to Cush. But the Midrash says that actually the name of God is embedded throughout the book of Esther. And every time it says 
Hamelach, the king. It doesn't say Hamelach Achashverosh, King Achashverosh. It just says Hamelach and doesn't tell you which king we're talking about. That is actually reference to God. And therefore, on this allegor- and therefore, on this allegorical level, whenever the verse says Hamelach Achashverosh, King Achashverosh, it's one thing. And whenever it says just Hamelach, the king, it's a reference to the Almighty. Now, who is Achashverosh in this analogy? or in this, uh, this level of allegory, it's a reference to the Yetzirah, evil inclination. And, our, uh, and he quotes the Talmud, Talmud says that there is a three-headed monster called the Yetzirah, evil inclination, that is the force that incites man to sin. And then there's the Satan, the Satan, that's the force that prosecutes that sin. And the third component of this triumvirate, the third aspect of this monster is the angel of death, which is the one that meets out the punishment, which is the executioner. These are three aspects of one whole, and they are going to be referenced by Achashverosh, and by Memuchan, and by Haman. Haman is going to be the Satan in the analogy. Achashverosh is going to be the Yetzirah inclination. And finally, Memuchan is going to be the angel of death. Now, how does he get to this? So he starts off by saying, the Talmud says, why was King Achashverosh, why was he called Achashverosh? And the Talmud gives us four reasons why King Achashverosh was named thusly. Number one, Achashverosh means the brother of the head or the first one, Achrosh, the brother of Rosh. That is the reference of the Talmud to the brother of Nebuchadnezzar, of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. And his successor, if you will, on the world stage is going to be Achashverosh. And they are brothers. And in fact, he quotes the verse in Daniel that describes Nebuchadnezzar as Rosh, as the head. And the brother of the head, well, that's Ach Shel Rosh, Achashverosh. Moreover, he is similar in character to the head, to Nebuchadnezzar, says the Talmud, because Nebuchadnezzar killed and Achashverosh wanted to kill. N- n- is someone still on, uh, not on mute? We're hearing a lot of noise here. Does that what, uh, anyone else hear that? Okay, let's try this again. Nebuchadnezzar killed and Achashverosh was similar. He also tried to kill. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed and Achashverosh tried to destroy as well. That's the first reason why he's called Achashverosh. The second reason is he's called Achashverosh from the word shachor, which means black, because Achashverosh blackened Israel like a pot. The third reason, says the Talmud, why he's called Achashverosh is because when people remember him, they say ach, which means, oh, woe to me, woe unto my head, ach on rosh. Achashverosh is ach on rosh, woe unto my head. Such devastation. And finally, the fourth reason why he's called the as a Talmud is because Hakol Russian. Everyone became poor in his time because he charged a lot of taxes. So again, we have a Talmud. The Talmud's trying to figure out what is the meaning of this name, Achashverosh. And on a simple level, Talmud gives us four reasons as to why he's called Achashverosh. Says the Gon of Vilna, let's take the Talmudic interpretation to the level of Remez to the allegorical level. The brother of a Rosh, the brother of a head, that is a reference to the primordial snake. The Yetzahara, which is Achashverosh, is the brother of the primordial snake. He quotes a verse in Lamentations, Hayu Tzareha Lirosh, those who caused pain and destruction to the Jewish people became a Rosh. Our enemies are Rosh, they are the head, they come first. In fact, the Yetzir Hara is the one that dominates a person from the get-go. The Yetzir Tov, the good inclination, only arrives as a person matures. We first have the pain. We first have the struggle. We first have to have the effort of the battle with the Yetzir Hara. That comes Rosh. That comes first. And then afterwards, we can potentially get the reward. This world, the world of struggle, comes before next world, the world of the ultimate purpose, namely the world of reward. So Achashverosh is the Yetzhara in this an- analogy, and he's the brother, quote-unquote, of the primordial snake. The snake, 
he killed the wicked. The Yetzara tries to kill the righteous. The snake destroyed the first temple. Achashverosh, the Yetzara, is going to try to destroy the third temple. But the Almighty won't allow that because with the dawn of the third temple, says the Talmud, the Almighty will slaughter the Yetzara. So this is, this is how we start off the book. We are introduced to a character, and of course, there's the historical character, and there's the historical story, and there's the simple way of understanding the entire story. And then we're introduced to the concept of remis, of allegory, and then there's also an allegorical tale over here as well. Again, these are not mutually exclusive. They're both true. There's just different levels of the strata, and now we're being introduced to this deeper level. Ahasuerus is the Yetzirah. He's the brother, so to speak, of the primordial snake. Says the Talmud, he blackened the face of Israel like the sides of a pot. Says the God of Vilna, black and darkness is always a reference to the Yetzirah, to the Satan, to the angel of death, to this three-headed monster. V'choshech al penei tehom, second verse of the Torah, there's darkness on the face of the depths. Tehom is the same letters of hamaves, which means death. Death blackens a person. The Yetzirah is the force that wants to kill us. And that is hinted to in Ahasuerus. He blackened everyone on the simple level. Of course, he caused pain and destruction to the people. On this allegorical level, he is trying to cause death to us. It causes woe. All the source of all pain and suffering that we have is because of this force, the Yetzirah. And it causes poverty, why? So again, on a simple level, Ahasuerus charges taxes. On the allegorical level, the Yetzirah causes poverty. And he quotes the Mishnah. The Mishnah says, whoever listens to the agenda of the Yetzirah, whoever capitulates to the seductions of the Yetzirah will result in poverty. Whoever unburdens himself from the yoke of Torah gets the yoke of responsibility and, and, and people upon him. Namely, they are going to be financially challenged. So that's the introduction. Who's Ahasuerus? He is the Yetzirah on this allegorical level. So let us read the first verse of Esther and see what happens. And again, it's quite helpful to have the book of Esther in front of you, but I'm going to read it for verse nonetheless. And it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. He is the Ahasuerus who reigned from Hodu to Kush, 127 provinces. In those days, when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne, which was in the Shushan, in Shushan capital, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and his servants, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and officials of the provinces being present, and so on. So we have a description of King Ahasuerus. It's the third year of his reign. He is the king of 127 provinces, and he's making a huge party when he is sitting on his royal throne in Shushan, his capital. What's going on over here? So again, they're going to Vilna, they're going to go to the Talmud, and the Talmud's going to explain the verse on a simple level, and the going to Vilna is going to show that on the allegorical level, that Talmud holds true, and there's a deeper message as well. So the verse starts, Vayihi, and it was, and it was in the days of Ahasuerus. Explains the Talmud. Every time it says the word Vayihi, and it was, it is a description of pain. Explains Rashi, uh, or ex explains the Gona Vilna, that this is a description of the reign of the Yetzara. The Yetzara is like a king, and it controls a person. And the days of the Yetzara are full of pain. And the pain is really a double pain. Because there are people who capitulate to the Yetzara, and they're going to face pain. And there are people who don't give in to the Yetzara, and those people are going to have to fight the eights around. That's also painful. So the first word, says the Talmud, it's describing on a simple level, there was a painful experience in times of Ahasuerus. On a deeper level, or on the allegorical level, there is pain in the reign of the eights around. Continues the Talmud. There was a double pain, vai and he, vai he. The word vai means pain or suffering, and the word he means pain and suffering. Vayihi, a double pain. The Yetzirah is a source of suffering. For the righteous who fight the Yetzirah, the suffering is in this world. We have to struggle with the Yetzirah. For the wicked who capitulate to the Yetzirah, 
who capitulate to the Yitzhara, they don't suffer in this world, they suffer in the next world. That's the first word of the book of Esther. Vayihi b'yemei Achashverosh, in the days of Achashverosh. Who Achashverosh? He is Achashverosh. So it says, again, the, 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 the days of Achashverosh, he is Achashverosh. It repeats it. Says the Talmud, why does he repeat? Why does the verse repeat, he is Achashverosh? Says the Talmud, he is Achashverosh. He was wicked from the beginning until the very end. So again, on a simple level, it's a reference to Achashverosh the king, who was wicked from beginning to his end. On the allegorical level, it's referring to the Eight Sahara, who is evil, who's trying to get us to sin from the beginning to the very end. He is always wicked from beginning to end. He's relentless. No matter what you do, he is always trying to get you to sin. And then the Goan of Vilna takes us to a little bit of an interesting place. He quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that the Eight Sahara is described as three things. He's a king, because he controls, he rules. He is old. He's been there before you. He's been there since you were born. You are playing catch up in, in your war against the Yitzhara. So he's a king and he's old. And he's also a fool. Why is he a fool? It explains the go to Vilna because he's suicidal. Well, what does that mean? Why is the Yitzhara suicidal? It explains the go to Vilna based upon a reference from the Zohar. And the Zohar is talking about the story of Lot and his daughters. So we know Lot was a member of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he was sitting at the entrance of the city. And the angels come to destroy the city, and they try to save Lot. And ultimately, he only say, he's only spared with his, with his wife, turns into a pillar of salt, and his two daughters are spared with him. And they go hide out in a cave in, in Sohar. According to the Remez level, according to the allegorical level, the Kabbalistic level of the Zohar, Lot in that story is a reference to the Yitzhahara as well. And his two daughters are the two primary sins, so to speak, that the Yitzhahara tries to enforce upon us. And in this story, Lot is sitting at the entrance of the city of Sodom. Just like with the Yetzirah itself, Lefetach Tchatas Robates, the Yetzirah is, is, is sitting at the entrance, crouching, ready to pounce. Similarly, Lot is at the entrance, crouching, ready to pounce. And what happens? Lot is successful, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah capitulate, and they all sin, and they get destroyed. But who suffers as well? Lot also suffers. Lot, too, has to escape from the inferno. And he loses his wife and his sons-in-law and his married daughters. And he has to hide out in a cave. And he thinks the whole world's over. In this analogy, again, this is important to stress. We're talking about different layers of the strata of the Torah. So, of course, when we read the Torah about Lot, on a simple level, we're talking about a person who was the nephew slash brother-in-law of Abraham who's the nephew slash a brother-in-law of Abraham. And, you know, he was someone who was close to Abraham. And then they went their separate ways and he went to Sodom and Gomorrah and he was saved because of the merit of Abraham. Of course, we're not talking about that level. On the allegorical level, on the Remez level, we're told that Lot is a reference to the Yitzhara. Now you'll see that Lot, i.e. the Yitzhara in this analogy, when the people get destroyed of Sodom and Gomorrah, the people that the Yetzirah incited to sin, the Yetzirah itself also gets punished. And the way it's described in the Zohar, it's thrown into Gehenim. It's thrown into purgatory. It's thrown into a place called Tsoar. Tsoar means pain. And what happens? It wants to leave. Even though it descends to a very painful place as a result of its incitement, it desires, it lusts, to get out, to cause more people to sin. That's what Achishverosh is in this analogy. He is wicked from beginning to end. He's a king, he's old, and he's a fool because he has this death wish. No matter what he does, he is relentlessly evil. He is suicidally evil. He is doing whatever he can to get the people to sin. 
Okay, that's the beginning of, of the verse. He is Achashverosh from beginning to end. The Yetzara is evil. Hamolech mehodu ve'ad kush, who rules from hodu to kush. What does that mean? Who rules? He was the king who rules or who ruled from hodu to kush. Again, the Goravil goes to the Talmud to explain what this means. He was a king on his own. What does that mean? According to some, it's to his credit that he was fitting to be king. According to others, it was to his disgrace he was not fitting to be king, but he bribed his way to power. So again, the Talmud is talking about Ahasuerus, the man, the ruler, but the allegorical level, it's talking about the Sahara. And here we're told that the Yetzirah is ruling. And it's not because they deserve it. They weren't properly appointed. They didn't go through the normal channels to arrive at that position. Explains the Gona Vilna. The Yetzirah is the opposite of holiness. For holiness, you have to work to get it. The Yetzirah, i.e. Ahasuerus, on this level, he rules. He is in charge. And it's on his own, so to speak. He wasn't properly appointed to that power. No one said, hey, let me choose my king. Let me have some sort of democratic process. I want the Yitzhak to be to influence me. No, he's in charge. He's a ruler. It's an autocracy, and there's nothing he can do about it. And some sages in the Talmud say that's to his credit. There is a benefit of that. Because for the righteous who resist the Yitzhara, it's an opportunity for them to achieve greatness. It makes them worthy. And he quotes the Midrash. The Midrash says that the Yetzirah is tov ma'od. It's exceedingly good because it creates resistance that creates the opportunity for greatness. That's one side of the coin. But there's also a drawback for the wicked because they are following a king. They are obedient to a master who is not fit to be king. Its seductions are pathetic. And we ought not listen to them, but it bribes its way to glory. It bribes and deludes the eyes of people. It creates an allure and excitement that bribes us to following its suggestions. And this indeed is a great drawback. And this king rules from Hodu to Kush. So again, a simple level, that is the extent of the kingdom, the dominion, the hegemony of Ahasuerus. Says the Talmud, Hodu and Kush, where are these places? Brings two opinions. According to one opinion, they are on opposite ends of the world. And he ruled from Hodu on one end of the world to Kush in the opposite end of the world. A second opinion says the exact opposite. They're right next to each other. Hodu and Kush are in close proximity, and just as he ruled over Hodu and Kush in close proximity to each other, he also ruled on the entire world. Those are the two opinions in the Talmud on the simple level. Again, the Gona Vilna shows us that on the allegorical level, both the scripture and the Talmud are referencing something much deeper. So what does Hodu and Kush refer to on the allegorical level? Tells us the Gona Vilna, Hodu is a reference to birth. Kush is a reference to death. The Yetzirah rules a person, Mihodu van Kush, from birth to death, from cradle to grave. Hod means glory in Hebrew. Babies are glorious, they're beautiful, they're delightful, they're adorable. Kush means black the blackness of death. The Yetzirah rules a person from the glory of birth to the blackness of death. Now, what separates birth and death? How close is Hodu to Kush? So the Talmud, well, there's two, there's two opinions. According to one opinion, it's like from one end of the world to the other end of the world. They're vastly distant from each other. And to explain this, the going to Vilna, again, goes to the Talmud, and it tells us, the Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos, page 10a, that King David, he said five prayers, Baruch my soul pray. 
And that's a reference to the five different worlds in which David lived. David lived in five different worlds. When he was in his mother's uterus, or his mother's womb, he said, that was one world, he said a song to God. And when he was born and he saw the stars, he said a second song. And when he went, when he was nursing and suckling at, at, at his mother's bosom, he said a third song. And when he saw the downfall of the wicked, he said a fourth song. And when he looked at the day of death, he said a fifth song. These are five different worlds that every person must traverse from birth to death. Hod and Kush are indeed worlds apart. And the dominion of the Yitzhara spans it all. That's the first opinion. The second opinion is that birth and death are like a flash of the of, of lightning, a bolt of lightning, uh, 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 just a flutter apart from each other. Just like Jonah. Jonah was rebuked for lamenting the plant. Shebin Laila Haya, Ubin Laila Ava, it appeared overnight and it perished overnight. Our life in the grand scheme of existence, on one hand, it's very vast, worlds apart from birth to death. On the other hand, it passes like a fleeting shadow. It's barely a blip. On history, birth and death, indeed, Hodu and Kush are right next to each other. Life is a flash. And just as the Yetzirah, i.e. Achashverosh, in this analogy, controls the person from birth to death, he controls the entire world, i.e. the power the Yetzirah has over the whole world comes from the control that he has over a person. Our sins affect the entire world. And how many provinces is this? It's 127 provinces. What does that mean? Says the Talmud, first he ruled over seven, and then he ruled, and then he ruled over 20 provinces, and finally he ruled over 100 provinces. Again, there's a hint here as well. The Yetzirah first controls a person for seven years. At seven, the Talmud says, that's when you start teaching children Torah, or you bring them to the Torah school. And therefore, the first seven years of a person, the Yetzirah has total reign because there's no counterforce. There's no counterweight. There's no counterbalance of Torah study. Torah is the antidote to the Yetzirah. At the age of seven, that's when there is the introduction of the opponent of the Yetzirah until seven, the Yetzirah rules completely. But then the Yetzirah rules from seven to 20 because at the age of 20, that's when a person begins to get judged by the heavenly court. And therefore, the Yetzirah says, hey, you don't need to worry about the sins that you're going to do right now, because after all, God's not going to punish you for the first 20 years of sinning. And therefore, the Yetzirah rules a person to, till the age of 20. And finally, once a person hits 20, the Yetzirah has such a strong vise over a person. He is so addic he's so addicted to sin and to bad character if he tries to repent, it's so hard. And indeed, the eight Sahara rules over a person until they die at the age of 100. The verse says, Rejoice, O youth, while you are young. Let your heart lead you to enjoyment in the days of your youth. Follow the desires of your heart and the glances of your eyes. When you're young, you don't have to pay for sin. But you should know that God will hold you to account for all such things. This is a verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. When you're young, you're not liable to be punished. Go ahead, knock yourself out. But ultimately, you will be held to account for that because those bad habits will linger past the time when you are already accountable for them and that will result in you being judged by the Almighty. So there we have it first. So there we have it, verse one. It's describing the reign of Ahasuerus which on a simple level is referring to a king of Persia who ruled 127 provinces from Hodu to Kush. And on this allegorical level, it's describing the reign of the Yitzhak of a person from the beginning of their life, from birth to death, from the age of seven to the age of 20 to the age of 100, from cradle to grave, the Yitzhak is in control and they are relentless. It is evil from beginning of its existence until its end. And that, of course, is a double woe. It's a woe for the righteous. It is a woe for the wicked. But it's also 
something positive, there is also a silver lining. There's also some credit over here, so to speak, in that it does give us the opportunity to achieve greatness. Okay, so we have the introduction of the character, Achishverosh, and what happens next? We're describing a banquet that he makes. When he was sitting on the royal throne on the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his officials and all his servants, the army of Persia and Media, the nobles and the officials of the provinces being present. And at this feast, he displayed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his splendorous majesty for many days, 180 days. So again, a simple level, we're talking about the church making a 180-day party where he's displaying all the riches and there's all these officials from Persia and Media and all these officers, noblemen, they're all attending this 180-year, this 180-day festival. But when does this happen? <clears throat> but when does this happen? It happens when the king sits and rests on his throne. That's what we're told in verse 2. And in verse 3, we're told it's the third year of his reign in the capital city of Shushan. Talmud says that this is a reference to the third year. That's when Achashverosh, his mind was calmed. He was happy, so to speak, with his reign because based upon his calculation, he, he was worried about his kingdom enduring, but now he was calm. He was sitting securely on his throne. Explains the Gona Vilna on a deeper level, the eight Sahara, at the age of three, that's when a person develops what's called das, develops what's called knowledge. And he quotes many sources to this effect. The verse, uh, the Talmud says in the book of Ivamos, that the Talmud says in the book of Sanhedrin that the produce, the fruit that Adam and Eve ate, that was a wheat. A fruit. It brings different opinions. Was it, was it wheat? Was it maybe an esrog? Was it maybe a fig? Was it wine? According to one opinion, it was wheat. Why? Because it's called Eitz Hadas, the tree of knowledge, and wheat begets knowledge. And when a child starts eating wheat, that's when they get knowledge. And that's when their excrement smells, says the Talmud. That means is that as a child gets more knowledge, that is when there is an intensification of the rule of the Yetzara above them. Explains the Talmud, when a person increases knowledge, they increase sorrow. As the child has more knowledge, the Yetzara has more control over the person. And when does that happen? In the third year. That's when the child increases sense and thus increases sorrow. We like to call this the terrible twos when kids become unwieldy because the eight Sarah is really in control of them because now they have a little bit of brains and that is when there's a market increase in the power of the eight Sarah. And that's why the eight Sarah on the third year of its reign is making a party. It's sitting securely on its throne. So the God of Vilna explains something fascinating over here. We know of course that God has a throne. It's described in scripture. Of course, we don't really understand what that means, but God is thrown. And here we have the fake God, the pretender God, the faux God, the false God, the Yitzhahara. It too has a throne. Well, what comprises the throne of the Yitzhahara, the false God? The throne, we're told here, has four legs. And the four legs are comprised of the four people who are not welcomed before God. The flatterers, the liars, the scoffers, and those who say Lashon Hara. Says the Talmud, those four groups are not welcomed before God because they are part of the other, so to speak, reign, the other dominion, the fraudulent and pitiful dominion of the Yitzhahara. And the four legs of the Yitzhahara's throne, of Ahasuerus' throne, are these four people, the flatterers, the flatterers, the liars, the people who speak with Shonara, and the scoffers. Now, the Gordon Villa points out that if you look in the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, it talks about the Chashmal, which is the angel, so to speak, very close to God, whatever that means. It explains the Gordon Vilna, just like there is a Chashmal for God, the fake God also has a Chashmal. 
And these four letters of Hebrew, Chashmal, they correspond to the four legs of the Yitzhara's throne. The ch sound is for chanifin, the flatterers. Chash is for the shakranim, the liars. Ma is mesapre lashon hara, those who speak lashon hara. And the last sound, the L sound, is for leitzim, is for the scoffers. So there is, so to speak, these, these twin dominions, if you will, we have to choose, do we want to submit ourselves to God and his reign, and the enduring reign, or to the fake reign of the Yitzhara, which also has a throne, and that throne is comprised of those four legs, the sinners that are not welcome before God. And then he tells us that the seat of the throne of the Yitzhara is haughtiness, and the Yitzhara itself, who sits on the seat, is lust. So we have this picture of Achashverosh being symbolic of the Yitzhara, sitting on its throne, and the throne is in Shushan Habira, Shushan, the capital city of Shushan. The word Shushan means a lily. It's kind of flower. It's a red and white flower. The Gona Villa again resorts to the Kabbalistic literature to tell us that the lily symbolizes the blood and the fat, the two parts of a kosher animal they're not allowed to eat, the red and the white. Shushan is the seat of Ahasuerus, of the Israel's monarchy, and on this allegorical level, it is a reference to the seat of the Yetzirah in the fat and the bloods. In effect, what this is telling us, when you have a kosher animal, there's parts of it that are still contaminated. And that's the fat and the blood, and if you eat that, you're imbibing from the Yetzirah. And it's a beautiful flower because... That's part of the design. It's, it gives off the appearance of beauty, of being healthy, of being natural, being wholesome, but ultimately it's deadly. Ultimately, it's going to kill you. And then we have a description of the feast. The Yetzirah is intensifying its allegoric, the Yetzirah is intensifying its road rule over a person. And the king invites the ministers and the servants and the people for the noblemen of Persia and Media, and the governors and the noblemen. What this means is, is that the Yetzirah runs on a hierarchical system. There's the king, if you will, that's the Yetzirah itself, and there's all these bad characters that, so to speak, nourish from the king, from the Yetzirah, and it works like, in, again, in this tiered our allegorical system, you have like different forces and different desires and different impulses and different bad behavior that are all subsidiaries, so to speak, of the Yitzhahara. And then he tells us, again, going back to Lot, that Lot is symbolic of the Yitzhahara. And there's this war, if you will, between the camp of Abraham and the camp of the Yitzhahara of Lot. And Abraham is someone who is such a great hero because he was able to separate himself from the camp of Lot and expel the Yitzhara from within him and shake himself free of the noxious influence of the Yitzhara. And it specifically mentions the ministers of Persia and Media. Persia and Media. Talmud says that Persia and Media made a pact. If we're kings, then you'll be like the vice king, you'll be the minister. And if you're kings, then we'll be the ministers, the second in command. There's this pact, they're gonna to work together, whoever's in charge, the other one is second in command. It explains the going to Vilna, that these two forces are a reference to lust and the pursuit of honor. And these are the twin forces trying to influence a person with the eight Sahara. And a person on the influence of the Yitzhara is going to alternate between these two competing desires. The word paras, which means Persia, the literal definition means to be cut up. Parus, prusa, means to cut up something. That is a reference to lust. Lust is always cut in half, always. You can never die and have all your lust fulfilled. You're only going to have half of it. You're only going to have half of it. And if you fulfill that half and you, get it, you try to get a bigger half, you also get only half of that. 
A person does not pass before they're able to accomplish more than half of their lust. The Persians, well, they're lustful. The Medes, they're about a different form of the Yitzhara. That's the pursuit of power, of honor, of prestige, of money, of materialism. And again, the Gona Vilna brings a Talmud to this effect. And by the way, I'm cutting out a lot of stuff here just to make it a little bit more understandable. Each one of these ideas that the Gona of Vilna brings to explain like the, the Medes, the Medes, that's a reference to pursuit of money and power and prestige. He brings all kinds of Talmuds to prove that. But you'll have to trust me or look in the actual sources. Uh, the book of Baba Kama, for example, uh, for example, the book of Baba Kama, page 103a, it describes the relationship between media and money. And again, he invokes the two daughters of Lot. That's a reference to the two kings of the Yitzhak, lust and pursuit of materialism. And here it's the Persians and the Medes. And what is the king doing during this? feast. He is displaying the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his splendorous majesty for many days, 180 days. Says the Talmud, what does that mean? He is wearing the garments of the high priest. The Medes and the Persians and the Babylonians, they hijacked the garments of the high priest. And during this 180-day festival, Ahasuerus bedecked himself in the very garments of the high priest. He stole the garments and now he's wearing them as if they were his. And that's what it means. He's trying to display his honor. So again, we see another idea on the deeper level, on the allegorical level, that the Eight Sahara is portraying itself as being superior like the high priest, but ultimately it's a fraud. Ultimately it's fake. Its superiority is not real. This haughtiness is undeserved. It's stolen from the high priest. Now, how many days is the Yitzhara celebrating with all its acolytes, with all its lieutenants? 180 days. What's the meaning of that particular number? <clears throat> what is the meaning of that particular number? So again, the Gona of Vilna has a brilliant calculation. Yamim Rabim, many days, Shmonim Umayas Yom, 180 days. The term Yamim Rabim, many days, where does it appear elsewhere in scripture? So he finds a verse in Leviticus 15, when a woman has a discharge of blood, Yamim Rabim, for many days. And this is the laws of purity and impurity, complicated laws of the book of Leviticus. But how many days are Yamim Rabim? How many days are many days? So the Midrash says that it is three days. Yamim is two days. Rabim is another day, which means three days. Ask the Midrash, wait, wait a minute. If it's three days, why is it called many days? Many days sounds a lot more than three days. Says the Talmud, because, says the Midrash, because they are painful days. So again, let's just figure out this calculation. Ahasuerus' party is Yamim Rabim, many days, 180 days. How many days, many days, explains the Midrash, three painful days. Okay, let's do some math over here. How many days are there in a year? So we know the answer. There's 365 and a quarter days a year. Now we have a Talmudic principle that partial days are counted as full days. So if you follow that principle, what do we have? 366 days in a year. But half of those days are nighttime, when people are asleep. And therefore, the Yetzirah doesn't really control them. So how many days does the Yetzirah actually have control of, over a person? Well, it's 183 days. Is that right? Which is half of 366. And then you have Yamim Rabim. You have three painful days. There are three painful days for the Yetzara that people don't sin. And that is the day of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the first day of Elul. These are days that even the sinners stop sinning. By the way, if you remember, in the book of Jonah, he referenced those three days as well. But of course, the math doesn't shake out because half of those, because half of those days are already gone with the nighttime reductions. 
And therefore, the Gona Vilna adds three more days where we fast in the month of Ab and Tammuz and Teves. So we have six painful days for the Yitzhar where we don't sin. So if you reduce those six days, but it's really only six half days because the nights of those days have already been reduced, you take the 183 and you reduce it to 180. How many days does the Yitzhar have a field day, have a banquet, have a feast upon people when they just sin and follow his ways? 180 days. 180 full days where the Yitzhar is in total control. Half of the time, nighttime doesn't count. And there are six days, which is really uh, three days if you're counting only the days and not the nights. There's three days where people don't sin, and therefore the only celebration lasts for 180 days. The Yitzhar, when it controls a person, it's for 180 days out of 365. That's when it has a feast. And then we read verse 5. And verse 5 is going to be the first verse where it references just king, Melech, Hamelech, the king, but not Hamelech Achashverosh, not King Achashverosh. And it says, and when these days were filled, the king made a seven day feast. For all the people who were present in Shush in the capital, great and small alike, in the courtyard of the garden of the king's palace. So we have our first verse where it's not talking about King Achashverosh, the eight Saran, the analogy. Rather, it's talking about just the king, which is a reference to the Almighty. What does this mean? So the Talmud again tells us uh, so, so the Gona Villa tells us that at the conclusion of these days on the allegorical level it's not a reference to the conclusion of the 180 days rather it's a conclusion of the three days where a person doesn't where a person doesn't sin so at the conclusion of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the first day of Elul and the three fast days God makes a banquet for a person God allows a person to return to his sinful ways. The Almighty allows a person to be challenged, to be tested by the Yitzhahara, by the inclination. And this is a party that the Almighty condones. It's for the entire nation who is present in Shushan Habira. For the entire nation that's present in Shushan Habira. This is the entire nation that's present at the epicenter, so to speak, of a person. What the Golden Villain explains is as follows. Every person is a collection of good and bad character. It's parts of us that we have within us that are good and parts of us that we have within us that are bad. And parts of stuff, and parts, and the parts of us that are bad, some of those things are innate. We're born just with a natural predisposition to certain bad things. And part of our bad character are earned bad things, namely things that we picked up, bad habits we picked up along the way that the Yitzhara brought upon us. So certain parts of our bad character are inborn, are innate, are inherent, while others are earned, are external, if you will. Now, if you look at this party, there's a 180-day party that the Yitzhara runs and that's for all the noblemen of Persia of media of, of all these distant places the Yitzra first makes a party for the external people for the people who are distant for the outsiders and then there's the party for the people in Shushan Abira for the people who are the insiders people who live in the capital if you will i.e. the people the characters that are innate what the Talmud explains here what's happening over here is that the Yitzhahara, or even Achashverosh, he has to choose which, which contingency to prioritize. It's almost like a political campaign. You have your base, do you want to reinforce your base? Or do you want to reach out to outsiders or to people's kind of independents, if you will, who are vacillating between the various candidates? Are you going to veer to the right, veer to the left, veer to the center? There's different strategies for political campaigns. 
You're trying to shore up your base. You're trying to attract the moderates. You're trying to attract the independents. That's the way it works in political campaigns. And that's the way it works as well, we're told, with the Yitzhara. The Yitzhara has its base. That's the character flaws that are innate. But the, what the Yitzhara actually does is it focuses first on the characteristics that are not inherent, i.e. the ones that are distant, and only then after the 180 day festival is over, only then does it shore up those that are inherent. And the Talmud says, is this wise or is this foolish? On one hand, it's wise because those that are close to you, you can be confident that they're secure. Focus on, on acquiring new subjects and only then reinforcing your existing subjects. On one hand. On the other hand, it's foolish because if a person rebels against the Yitzhah Haram, it's easier to free oneself of its clutches because those bad habits that you have innately are not being reinforced by the Yitzhara, who's always trying to seek new ground to conquer. Okay, so that's a, a very interesting idea, and let's continue. So there's a seven-day banquet. And again, this is a banquet that's sanctioned by God. What does it mean there's a seven-day banquet that's sanctioned by God? Says the Gorn of Vilna, he compares this to the Talmud about Shammai. Shammai, all of his days, we're told in the book of Dates on page 16a, all of his days he would eat in honor of Shabbat. If he would find a nice piece of meat on Sunday, he would dedicate it for Shabbat. And then on Monday, if we would find a superior cut of meat, well, then he would buy the new cut of meat and eat the first, so to speak, piece of meat that he had reserved for Shabbos, that now he found the better one, he would consume that and now save the second one for Shabbat, and so on. Tells us the Talmud, from the first day of, of the week, from Sunday already, Shammai is preparing for Shabbat. So what's the deeper meaning over here? So the Gordon Villa tells us that the seven days of the week symbolize the seven decades of a person's life. You live for the first seven, you live for the first six decades, and in the seventh decade, you go to the world that's all Shabbos, to the spiritual world. Says Shammai, already in your first decade, you should be planning for Shabbat, i.e. planning for your afterlife. Similarly over here, the Almighty makes a seven-day banquet. And what's the person doing? The person who attends this banquet is choosing to indulge in the banquet, but not to stockpile for day seven, not to stockpile for the afterlife. And God says, okay, here's a seven-day banquet. You want it? Go for it. Knock yourself out. The Almighty is making a seven-day banquet, which is, again, symbolic for the 70 years of a person's life. And where is this banquet located? It's in the courtyard of the garden of the king's palace. In which king? It doesn't say King Achishverosh, it says king, which is a reference to God. So again, on the allegorical level, God has a palace, which has a garden, which has a courtyard. Well, what does that mean? God's palace is what we call paradise, the garden of Eden. Being in God's proximity. And that has two levels. There's the upper level, which is called the palace, and there's the lower level, which is called the garden. A soul that is fortunate enough to end up in God's proximity starts off on the lower level in the garden so it can acclimate and acculturate to the spiritual world, and bit by bit it gets upgraded to the spheres that are more fitting to it, eventually reaching the palace. So we have a party, a banquet. Where is that? That's in the courtyard of the garden of the palace. It's not the palace. It's not the highest level. It's not even in the garden. It's on a lower level. It's in the courtyard. It's outside. What is the courtyard of the garden of the king's palace? That is a reference to this world. This world, again, on the allegorical levels, the mighty saying, here's a feast. You have 70 years to partake in the feast. Or you could choose to try to stockpile for the seventh year, i.e. the seventh decade, i.e. your afterlife, 
which world are you going to prioritize? The people who want to live a life of hedonism and submission to the Yitzhah the Yitzhah says, okay, you want this? I will allow you to do that. And they can have their seven-day, i.e. seven-decade party in the courtyard in this world. And the next several verses are going to describe what this party looked like. There were hangings of white, fine cotton, turquoise wool, held with cords of fine linen and purple wool upon silver rods and marble pillars. The couches of gold and silver were on the pavement uh, and made out of marble. The drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels to diverse vessels of diverse form and royal wine in abundance and accordance with, in accordance with the king's wealth. And the drinking was according to the law. There was no, cons no, there was no coercion, for so the king had established for every officer in his, of his house to do according to each man's pleasure. <laughs> the next three verses describe the opulence and the grandeur of this seven-day party. This is the party that the Almighty prepares for us in this world. It gives us a choice. Do you want to live a life of hedonism or a life of thinking about the future, a life of planning for the future, a life of planning for the afterlife? And if you'll notice... It starts off with incredible delights, but then it just goes up and up. The, eight, the Yetzirah increases the intensity incrementally. He started off with nice food, nice clothing, and then it wants gold and silver and diamonds and precious stones, and it doesn't stop even if the floors are paved with precious stones. It's never satisfied. You can never die. With half of your desires fulfilled, it just increases. And again, the Gona Vilna is going to invoke the Talmud and see how the Talmud explains on the simple level and then show us the allegorical level already found in the Talmud. Chur karpas utcheles. What does chur mean? Says the Talmud, it's a fabric full of holes. This world of delight that we have a choice to partake in and indulge in, it will render our soul full of holes. It will irreparably damage our soul. Carpets of white wool, which is karpas, carpets of white wool. What does that mean? Well, what does that mean? It means that the Yitzhara is going to make this hedonistic pleasure look white and innocent and harmless and innocuous and benign and even pure. It's going to be white. We're not going to get a sense that this desires that we want to indulge in are dangerous, are harmful, are going to riddle our soul with holes. It's tcheles. Tcheles is blue wool. It's the wool that we put on the tzitzis, which the Talmud says it symbolizes that we should look at it and we should remember the sea and then the heavens and then the throne of God. The holiest, one of the holiest colors we have in Torah is tcheles. And the sins that the Yetzirah is going to present us, and the mind is going to allow it to present us, the indulgences of this world, we're going to find nothing wrong with it. In fact, we're going to say it's even holy. It's pure, it's white, it's tcheles, it's blue, it should remind you of God. It's a holy thing. The Yetzirah makes sin holy. And what we're going to see over here is tied up with cords of fine linen and purple wool. It starts off with white and it slowly gets you addicted to more and more luxuries. And before you know it, you are caught up in ropes of purple wool, the most expensive and royal wool. And thanks to the Yitzhara, you are hopelessly tied up in materialism and things that don't eternally matter. There are beds of gold and silver. Again, the Gonaville goes to the Talmud. What does that mean? According to one opinion, it means that whoever deserved silver beds got a silver bed. Whoever deserved gold beds got a gold bed. That's the first bit in the Talmud. The second bit in the Talmud is that, no, you can't say that because then you would have envy. So instead, everyone got beds of silver with legs of gold. So according to Rabbi Yehuda, the first opinion in the Talmud, everyone's wealth in this world is fitting to their luck. Some people are lucky enough to get silver, and some are lucky enough to get gold. And there's nothing you can do about that. Comes along the second opinion of the Talmud and says, wait a minute, that would cause envy. So instead, 
we have beds of silver with leads of gold that will ameliorate the envy. So what's going on in here? Again, it explains the Golden Vilna. Whatever you get in this world, whatever indulgence that you partake in in this world, that is going to come out of your reward in the next world. Hence, the righteous don't want too much in this world because that's going to deduct, exhaust from their eternal reward in upon the next world. What you get here in silver, you lose there in gold. And therefore, there is no envy. Everyone is happy with the riches of his fellow. I don't even want it because if I do have it, it's going to be reduced from my reward in Olam Abba. And then it tells us that there are floors made out of marble. Again, the Talmud says what that means is, is that these are stones that the owners have to invest a lot of effort and time to achieve. The hedonistic wealth that deducts from our afterlife is not a reference to things that we get by chance. It's a reference to things that we doggedly pursue. What this is teaching us is, again, on the allegorical level, that this world is full of delightful things. If we make this world a pursuit of hedonistic and materialistic pleasures, our sole focus, that is going to deduct from our reward in the world to come. Dar Visochares, again, these are uh, descriptions of what was present in this banquet, says the Talmud, Dare Dare, which the Golden Village explains is generations and generations. The destruction that we could do to ourselves in this world can be present for generations. The second opinion says the Talmud, Dar means Durar, which means remission. Sin causing Sin causes remission of responsibility. The sinner believes that they are freed from obligation. The God of Vilna quotes two teachers of the Talmud. Once a person sins and repeats the sin, it becomes as if it is permitted. When someone dies, they're absolved of all responsibility to mitzvos. The Talmud tells us that the wicked are considered dead even in their lifetime. A wicked person is someone who says, I'm absolved already now from responsibility for mitzvos. And that's the idea over here, that this party contains within it durar, remission, the sinner says, I am not responsible at all. And again, we have a description of the banquet. There is wine and gold. There's a fusion of different desires here. Don't think that you could have one and not want the other. You could want them both. And then it says, Bekelim Mikelim Shonim, vessels of diverse form. It explains the Talmud that they used the vessels of the temple. And a prophetic voice announced, You're making the same mistake again. It explains the go to Vilna on the allegorical level. What this is telling us is that the sinner does not learn their lesson, it repeats. The, per, the sinner repeats the same mistakes again and again. Fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Well, that's shame on... Sorry, how's it go? That's like George Bush forgetting how to say it. No. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Okay. So uh, if, you're, if you're a sinner and you're fooled twice, well, again, you could be held uh, accountable for that. Ve'yein malchus rav kiedamelech. There is wine that is uh, a kingly wine in accordance with the king's wealth, says the Talmud. The wine is older than you. Every person was served wine that was older than them. On the allegorical level, it's a reference to the Yitzhara is older than you. You are not as old or as clever as your Yitzhara. Verse 8 tells us, that the drinking was accordance with the law. There was no coercion. There was no compulsion. Don't think that the Yetzirah forces a person to sin. A person doesn't have any choice. No, it's not the will of God. The will of God is that a person is influenced by the Yetzirah, is seduced by the Yetzirah, is tempted by the Yetzirah, but ultimately it is their choice whether or not they want to Capitulate, the Yetzirah cannot force or compel obedience. Our sins are our choices. 
So what do we have over here? Achashverosh the Yitzhara, he's ruling, making this big party for 180 days. And our whole life is really seven decade banquet where we have to choose what's important to us. Do we want to give in to the delights and to the indulgences? Or do you want to plan for day seven, i.e. for the afterlife? Do we want to make a life one of prioritization of our eternal self or prioritization of our temporary self? And then in verse nine, we meet a new character that is Vashti, the queen of Ahasuerus. Queen Vashti also made a feast for the women in the royal house of the king Ahasuerus. So we have two parties happening simultaneously, the party of Ahasuerus and the party of Vashti. The party of the Yetzahara, Ahasuerus, and Vashti, we're told, is a reference to a person's body. The male is described as the spiritual side, and the female is described as the physical side. Vashti is the wife. She is the body, the wife of the soul. Abraham and Eve are described as soul and body. And there's a struggle. Who is going to control the body? Is it going to be the soul? Or is it going to be the Yitzhahara? We're told in the Talmud that the primordial serpent seduced Eve and slept with Eve and made her his wife. Meaning, in the uh, layout, the architecture, if you will, of a person, there's the body, there's the soul. And the struggle between the soul and the Yetzirah is who is in charge of the body? Who influences the body? And when a person capitulates the Yetzirah, the Yetzirah is in charge. They become, so to speak, the husband, the director of the, of the direction, the guider of, uh, the, uh, of the choices of the body, the worldview of the body. And the body itself too, becomes a sinner as well. So we have the Yitzhara, which is symbolized by Ahasuerus. We have Vashti, which is a symbolizing, uh, which, which, reference, which references the body. And then what happens? On the seventh day, when the heart of the king is merry with wine, he speaks to his seven chamberlains, Mehuman, Bizasa, Harvona, Bitsa, Ab. Uh, it's hard for me to read in English. <laughs> These names are hard to read. On the seventh day, he tells Mehuman, Bizasa, Harvona, Bitsa, Avagsa, Zesarva, Karkas. So these are the seven chamberlains of the king. And they have a whole discussion to bring Queen Vashti before the king adorned in a royal crown. So if you examine this verse quite critically, You'll see that this is the seventh day when the heart of the king is merry with wine. It doesn't say King Yachashver, it says the king, which of course is a reference to God in this allegorical level. On the seventh day, i.e. the seventh decade, that's when the king is merry with wine, i.e. now God wants to give you reward, but not earlier. Now it's a time for a person to transition from the world of work and effort and toil into the world of reward. It's time to leave the courtyard and go in to the garden and go eventually into the palace. We are supposed to be consuming the wine now. The problem is that we consume the wine before it's ripe. We have these little buds of grapes. It's not ready. It's not ripe. And we need to wait to enjoy it properly. And the Eight Sahara, it's trying to get us to squeeze the grapes early, if you will, to try to cash in on our reward too early. And then we have the spoiled wine, and we have nothing left once the wine is, once the grapes are ready. According to one opinion in the Talmud, the fruit that Adam and Eve sinned with was a grapevine. And the way it's described in the literature is that Eve squeezed the grapes before they were ripe. That is the essence of the sin, the tree of knowledge, good and bad. It was a choice to indulge in pleasure and reward before things were ripe. In the seventh day, in the seventh day, when someone's about to pass, that's when the king, i.e. God, is merry with wine. That's when he's happy and desirous to reward us.
But the problem is we're nothing left at that time. And we have consumed all of the flawed wine. And now there's nothing left for us to enjoy now. He points out that the spies arrive in Israel before the wine was ripe. And they tried to squeeze it too early. That sin, the sin of the spies was emblematic of the sin of Adam and Eve. And he tells his chamberlains that he wants to bring Queen Vashti before the king adorned with the royal crown with the royal crown. The time has come for a person to pass. And the person, the body, the soul, it's time for them to be ushered in front of God. And the problem is, is that the person is not ready. The person's not primed for that audience. And again, they're going to villain goes to the Talmud. What does the Talmud say over here? What was happening on a simple level on a simple level, what was happening is that the king was drunk and they were having a huge debate as to which women are the most beautiful. Is it the women of Media? Is it the women of Persia? And the king of Ahasuerus says, no, it wasn't the Medes or the Persians. Rather, it was the Chaldeans who are the most beautiful, like my queen Vashti. Do you want to see her? That's what Ahasuerus told his ministers. And they said, yes, we want to see her, provided that she is unclothed. So again, the Golden Villain explains this on a deeper level. The desires of the Eight Sarah are the Persians and the Medes. The soul of the wicked, the destroyed soul, the soul that's been riddled with holes, that is referred to as the Chaldean. And again, it brings lots of proofs to substantiate this idea. Do you want to see it? The way of the Yetzirah is first to seduce a person, cause a person to sin, cause devastation, and then to publicize it. And they respond, yes, but she'll be naked. After sin, the luster is stripped off, the desire seizes, and it's naked. There's no more pizzazz. Ahasuerus, we're told, has seven advisors. There are seven angels who are close to God, who judge a person, oversee a person. And the false god, Aide Yitzharah, also has seven advisors, and they are hinted to in the seven ministers of Ahasuerus. And they make a decree, bring Vashti, bring the body in front of God to show the nations and the ministers, and she should be crowned with the crown of the kingdom. So what's happening here is like this. Persons live... They're 70 years, and they've done what they've done, and now it's time to come before God. And you're supposed to be wearing a crown. You're supposed to be crowned. You're supposed to be wreathed with the crown of Torah. You were beautiful spiritually when you were delivered to this world. And the question is, will you still be beautiful, and will you be adorned with the crown of Torah when you arrive before God for your post-mortem inspection? When someone dies and they are indeed spiritually beautiful, they've purified their bodies from all the contaminants, then that is portrayed, that is showed to all. But unfortunately, it wasn't the case in this, in this instance. In this instance, Vashti refused to come. The angel of death has come to take the person back home and the sinner refuses. And God, i.e. the king, is very angry. Explains the going to Vilna, what's happening over here? Before a person dies, even the Yetzahara, even the evil inclination, wants a person to repent. And the sinner is so addicted to the ways of sin, even when the Yetzahara wants it to repent, it refuses to do so. And God, so to speak, gets angry. It's not enough that you rebelled during your life. You want to rebel at the time of death as well. I want to take a little break here. I feel like uh, it's, it's getting long, and I, I'm trying to go fast. But uh, let, let me, let's, let, let's, let's pause for a break. I want to just take everyone's temperature here. We, we, uh, the, I'm trying to finish the first chapter here. 
and uh, there's still some more some more stuff I want to say, but uh, let's let's open up the the, the floor for uh, just. You know, yeah, how's everybody? If I can ask you guys to turn on your video so that our, our watch, our video, you know, our other members who only get to see this on through their email can see your face. So thank you, Rabbi. Go ahead, guys. Go ahead, Rabbi. Should we continue? I have there's probably like I would say another 20 minutes or so. Oh, I, I, I'm fine with you continuing. Go ahead. I think we're all is it, in, is it enjoy is it interesting? Is it enjoy yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, this Imagine. is gonna be something you're gonna to have to listen to a couple of times to really absorb all of the knowledge. I'm telling okay. you, this this is brilliant. I I, I you know, I, I did my notes and I'm like, I have 32 pages of notes, and this is with cutting out a lot of stuff. Okay, so I'm, I'm typing one. notes over here and I can't keep up. So I'm, I'm like, uh, I want to do it in one sitting, but it's a lot. But you can do it in two parts if you want. It's up to you. I don't know. No, only one. I want to do one okay. part. One part. So, okay. So, so I knew it'll take time. So I'm trying to do a little faster, but um, okay. So we still have some more time. But anyone who, if they feel like it's a little getting a little too long, you just, uh, you know, you can just check out. No worries. Okay. I won't be offended. Going at faster, all. my brain is going to explode. <laughs> okay, I'll try to slow down a little bit. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I will, we'll, we'll mute everyone again and, and continue. Yes, sir. Yes. I guess if nobody has a question or comment, go ahead. Okay, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, so no worries. Okay. Again, the going villain goes back to the Talmud. Vashti, Queen Vashti, refuses to come. Ask the Talmud, wait a minute, she was a very immodest woman. Why did she refuse to come in front of the king? So the Talmud tells us that she actually sprouted saras, leprosy, and she was embarrassed to show herself. She had all these boils and pimples and all that. She was embarrassed to show herself. It explains to go to Vilna on a deeper level. What this means is, is that when a person's about to die and come before God, if you will, all the blemishes of their soul become evident to them. You know, Tsaras, the Torah tells us, Tsaras is things that sprout upon a person when they commit sins. But we are on a much lower spiritual level than people of the Torah, and therefore those sins and those blemishes of our soul do not manifest themselves to us, but they're still present. And at a time of a person's death, suddenly all of the erstwhile present but invisible blemishes of their soul sprout to the forefront and they see it and they're embarrassed of it and they don't want anyone to see it and therefore they are going to refuse to come they're going to refuse to repent and they are going to be resistant to what's happening even though the Yitzhara says okay now it's time to come now it's time to repent the person the body says no now again the Talmud continues by telling us that the king was very angry. Why? Says the Talmud, because Vashti not only refused to come, she sent him a very disgraceful message, very, uh, a very insulting message. She said to him, my father who was also the king, King Belshazzar. He used to drink wine like a thousand men and did him come inebriated, but you, you have a little drink and you become senseless with wine. So again, on a simple level, that means this is that there's this exchange between the king, Gachashverosh, and Vashti, and she refuses to listen to his command. On a deeper level, what's happening is, over here is, is as follows. The person is being beckoned before God. It's time for you to die. Repent quickly before you die, because you're going to have your audience with the Almighty. But the person says that, no, I shouldn't die. My father was a sinner just like me, and he lived much longer than me. And therefore, it's not my time yet. And verse 13 tells us what happens. Then the king spoke to the wise men who knew the times, for such was the king's procedure to turn to all who knew law and judgment. So again, on one level, Achashverosh is is consulting his advisors and finding out what to do with this rebellious and recalcitrant queen who refuses to come. On the deeper level, on the allegorical level, God 
is going to accept the person's challenge. A person is making a demand saying that God is not being fear. I'm dying too young. Give me another chance. And God says, okay, let's bring in the people who know times, who keep track of what a person does with their life and what they need to be judged for. And of course, even though God is ultimately the judge and the witness and the execution and all that, the Almighty is eminently fair. And if a person has a question, a person quibbles with the Almighty's judgment and fairness, he wants us to know that he's going to be fair. And therefore, what do we have? We have the Almighty saying, okay, this person does not want to die. Let's see if their claim is any validity. And he consults the seven advisors. Explains the God of Vilna. Just like the Eight Sahara, the evil nation has, so to speak, seven forces around it. The Almighty also has seven angels that are internal angels, so to speak, close angels to God, whatever that means, who follow and monitor people. And they're figuring out what to do here. Uh, verse 15. By the law, what should be done to Queen Vashti for not having obeyed the bidding of King Nachashverosh conveyed by the head of the Chamberlains? What to do with Queen Vashti who refused to listen to King Nachashverosh? Again, this is the King Nachashverosh that she refused to listen to. Meaning the Eight Sahara urges a person to repent on their deathbed, but the sinner refuses to listen to even the Eight Sahara. So what happens? Verse 16. Memuchan declared before the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but against all the officials and all the people and all the provinces and all the provinces of King Achashverosh. So Memuchan speaks up and he says, Vashti is guilty. Vashti is guilty. Says the Talmud, who is Memuchan? So again, on a simple level, says the Talmud, Memuchan is Haman. Why is he called Memuchan? Muchan means prepared and ready. He's called Memuchan because he is ready for punishment. Says the Talmud as well. This shows us that even though he's listed last of these seven advisors, he is the most junior of the seven advisors. Nevertheless, he responded to the question. First, he jumped ahead of the line. So again, in this analogy, we have the king, is The king, when it does not say Achashverosh, is God. Vashti is the body. We haven't really met the soul yet, but we'll get to it in a little bit. And now we have Haman, and we have Memuchan. Explain the God of Vilna is that in this instance, Memuchan is Haman, but it's the version or the component of the Yitzhara that is the angel of death. So we have Achashverosh is the Yitzhara. We have Haman, who's going to be the Satan or the Satan, the, the, the prosecutor. And Memuchan is going to be the executioner. So again, like we said earlier, so again, like we said earlier, there's a three-headed monster, the Yitzhara, the Satan, and the angel of death. One incites, one prosecutes, and one executes. In this instance, it's talking about Haman, but not Haman, the prosecutor, Haman, the executioner, the force of God that extracts a person's soul and punishes them. Now, the God of Vilna asks a very interesting question. He says, wait a minute. If you figure out just the, the big picture of the layout of the land here, we have the seven advisors of Ahasuerus, the seven forces, so to speak, closest to the false god, the Yetzirah. And we have the seven advisors of God, the seven angels, so to speak, whatever that means, that are in God's proximity, and they're the ones who do his bidding. And here, Memuchan, which is Haman, is described as one of the seven angels that are close to God. What's the meaning behind that? How can Haman, slash Memuchan, slash the angel of death, be one of the seven angels that are close to God? And the answer is he jumped ahead, meaning that the head of the Samach Mem, of the Sitra Acha, of the Eitzahara, of Uncle Sam, as we call him, the head is holy. And he explains that the head of Esav is found where? 
in the cave of the patriarchs, in the lap of Isaac. The greatest force of evil, its head is holy, even though the rest of its behavior is not holy. And therefore, Mamuchan, i.e. the angel of death, is found in God's proximity, but only the head, so to speak. He jumped ahead. And then he quotes a fascinating Talmud of the book of Bavabasra, page 74b, about the Leviathan. The Almighty created two Leviathans, a male and a female. But the Almighty recognized, says the Talmud, that if they would cohabit, they'll create these monsters and they'll destroy the whole world. So the Almighty castrated the male and killed the female and put it on ice to be consumed by the righteous in some time in the future. So the Almighty salted the female Leviathan, and that's what we're going to enjoy in this future banquet. Fantastic. But the male Leviathan is still alive, but it's been castrated. Where is the male? Says the Talmud. In the future, when it's time to hunt down the male, the angel Gabriel is going to hunt down the Leviathan. But if God did not help the angel Gabriel, he would not be able to hunt it down. Continues the Talmud. Again, we, I don't know what any of this means, but I'm just quoting you what the Talmud says. When the Leviathan is hungry, he produces breath from his mouth and boils the waters of the depth. I don't know what that means, but it sounds a lot like climate change. And continues the Talmud. If the Leviathan does not place its head into the Garden of Eden, no creature can withstand its foul smell. So again, I, I freely admit, I have no idea what I'm talking about over here. I'm just reading what it says. But there's something called a Leviathan, this, this dreadful sea serpent, if you will. There's only one of them, the male. It's been castrated. And when it wants to eat, it does something. It wants to drink, it does something else. What does it do when it wants to drink? We're told it sticks its head into the Garden of Eden. How does such a nightmarish beast place its head in the Garden of Eden, same idea says the Gona Vilna, the head, so to speak, of the angel of death, the head of Asaph, the head of the Leviathan, they have some sort of connection to holiness, and therefore the head of Memuchan is found in God's close proximity. Now, what did the angel of death indeed say to God and the heavenly angels? Vashti, i.e. the body, sinned not only against God, she sinned against all the souls who were under the spell of the Yitzhara. She was a bad influence on all the people around her. And it could be disastrous. If you listen to the petition of the body, body doesn't want to die, you want to listen to the petition, what's going to be? That message is going to be publicized. It's going to get out. And the effects of that are going to be disastrous. For the queen's deed will go forth to all women, making their husbands contemptible in their eyes. When they will say, King Ahasuerus said to Queen Vashti before, to, 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 when they will say, King Ahasuerus said to, queen, to bring Queen Vashti before him, and she did not come. And this day, the princesses of Persia and Media who have heard the Queen's deed will speak of it to all the King's officials, and there will be much contempt and rage. If it pleases the King, let there go forth a royal edict before him, and let it be written the laws of Persia and Media, let it not be revoked, that Vashti never again appear before King Ahasuerus and let the king confer her royal estate upon another who is better than she. So we've read now up to, so we've read now up to verse 20 in chapter 1 of the book of Esther. What's happening here is as follows. It's time for the person to die. And they're a sinner. They've lived a very sinful life. But they make a plea before God. It's not my time to die yet. I want to stay alive. After all, my dad was also a sinner. He was able to live much longer. Why must I perish now? And the Almighty takes up this appeal. And the Almighty consults, so to speak, with his heavenly, uh, heavenly uh, retinue. And they say, the angel of death says, and the angel of death, Memuchan, says, no, if this gets out, if you allow the person to go off scot-free, everyone's going to follow suit and everyone becomes sinners. When when they hear the, that the Yetzirah 
i.e., Kina Hashverosh, tried to get the person to repent, and they didn't listen, certainly when the Eitzvah is trying to get a person to sin, they won't behave in a righteous and proper manner. And let this day, says Memuchan, i.e., the angel of death in this example, let the princesses of Persia and Media, again, we have Persian Media, the two daughters of Lot were told, whoever heard, they heard the words of the sinner does not want to repent, it's going to cause a lot, a lot of storm because the Almighty, because if the Almighty forgives the sinners, all others will follow their sinful ways. So what should happen instead? Don't listen to the petition. Instead, let there be this irrevocable edict that Vashti never yet appear, i.e., let the person die. The Godavilla tells us that when a decree of life or death is meted out upon a person, that decree is placed in the hands of messengers. If the decree is for life, it's placed in, a, in the hands of a holy angel. If the decree is for death, it's placed in the hand of a klipa, of a bad angel, whatever that means. And so long as the decree has not been delivered, it can be rescinded. Says Mamukhan, place this decree in the hands of Persia and Media and make it irrevocable that Vashti, i.e. the body, never again appear before the king. Because this person, even when his Yetzirah was telling him to repent, he refused to do so, he should not be given a second chance, he should not be allowed to heal from his illness, and instead, let this estate, let this kingdom, and this is the first reference we have to the soul, let the kingdom of the body be reincarnated in another body. Vashti has failed. Her destruction must be irrevocable. And what's going to be with her kingdom, if you will? Let that be conferred to another one who is better than she. And verse 20, we read, let the kings... Then the king's decree, which he will proclaim, shall be heard throughout all his kingdom. Great though it be, and all the wives will show respect for their husbands, great and small alike. Let this message reverberate throughout the world. Again, we have wives and husbands. In our analogy, the wives are the bodies and the husbands are the souls. Let people take the lesson from what happened to Vashti. What happened to people who passed, who were sinners? Let the people who are still alive take this lesson and let the wives hearken to the husbands, i.e. let the bodies be subservient to the souls. And finally, the final verse of chapter 1. Let this message be sent to all the king's provinces and each province in accordance with its script and each people with its language. Every man shall rule his home and speak with the language of, and speak with the language of his whole people. This message should be sent to every nation. The story of Vashti must be publicized to all. Vashti was a person who had an opportunity with seven days of a banquet and instead chose to sin. And at the time when they were supposed to be ushered before God, they still refused to repent. And all of their sins and blemishes bubbled to the surface and they were covered in leprosy. And a final decree was indeed sent out that they have no chance to be reinstated, they're not going to be healed, they are done, and that kingdom is going to pass on to a different person who is better than them. And this lesson is so important, it must be publicized everywhere. Everyone know this lesson. Everyone take it to heart. Let the wives obey the husbands. Let the souls decide the fate of man, and let them speak the language of the people. Let them retain their unique identity and their unique role and mission, and let them not kapitulate the Yitzhah. Thus ends chapter one of the book of Esther, and then the Golden Villa writes, from here on out, you're on your own. Henceforth, I'm not going to explain to you what's actually happening. I'm going to let you figure out yourself. And indeed, if you follow the rest of the story, we could really figure out what, what's actually going to happen. So we have this first king, so we have this first queen, and she dies. She's killed, and we find a new king, and we find a new queen. So we have the first queen, Vashti, she's dead, and then there's a search for a second queen, i.e. a second body, and that's going to be Esther. We're going to have a much better version, so to speak, of the body in round two. And we're told that the husband 
of Esther is a guy named Mordechai, who's righteous, and that's the soul. And then the king, i.e. the Yetzirah, intensifies, because the greater a person is, the greater the Yetzirah is. And with Haman and his ten sons, and that results in eleven forces that are pitted against the soul. Mordechai thinks he could stand and not bow, he resists, and the Yetzirah gets even stronger. And what happens ultimately? Ultimately, Mordechai is able to overcome these 11 forces, which are symbolized in the 11 curses, of course, in the Torah. And the duo of Mordechai and Esther, the soul and body, are ultimately able to triumph over the Yetzirah. And the book, of course, ends... And the book, of course, ends with the final verse, For Mordechai the Jew was viceroy to King Ahasuerus. He was a great man amongst the Jews and found favor with a multitude of his brethren. He sought the good of his people and he spoke for the welfare of all his seed. Mordechai now is the soul. He's been bedecked by the garments of, of royalty. He has overcome Haman, the force, and now the Haman, the negative force, and now the Yetzirah is actually friendly with Mordechai. And what this shows us is that Ahasuerus, the Yetzirah, is a force of evil, but ultimately we can actually commandeer that force and it can become a friend of ours. It can become a, an accelerator of the efforts of the Yetzirah. So what does this have to do with Purim? I think that this reading of the Megillah, of the Book of Esther, on this level, I think it does get to the heart of the lesson of Purim. On Purim, it's a time where we celebrate, so to speak, the holiness of the physicality, the holiness of this world, the holiness almost of nature. Even though there was no obvious overt miracle, God was still running the show. Even in nature, God has a say. Even in physicality, even in the mundane, it could be infused with holiness. Even outside the land of Israel, we can have miracles. That's the lesson of Purim. What do we do in Purim? We have a banquet. We get drunk. We do very physical and mundane things, but we infuse it with a layer of holiness. The test, the challenge that we face in our life, and the thing we're supposed to reinforce on, on Purim is... The question of how do we relate to this world? Is this world a banquet that's there to tempt us to make it our focus in our lives? And then we arrive at the end of the 70 years, we arrive in the palace gates and we're just not a good candidate. We have to swap out Vashti for Esther and hopefully then do it. Or are we going to take this world as an aid, as a tool to facilitate our trek, our journey, our odyssey, to eternity, to the afterlife. That's one of the central overarching messages of Purim. And of course, it's so beautiful to see how the story and the lessons and the insights and the takeaways can be viewed on so many different levels, on so many different strata, not only in the written, so to speak, scripture text of the story, but also in the Talmudic interpretation. And I think uh, with this insight, with this understanding, with this framework, we are encouraged to take the lesson of Purim and integrate it as well and hopefully take this opportunity, this festival to organize and calibrate our life to make sure that we are indeed living it properly. We are utilizing this world for what it's intended to be as an accelerator to facilitate our, our journey home. And hopefully we will stockpile all the goods, all the wine, all the benefits of this world and be ready for our audience with the Almighty. Thank you for listening. I know this was a little bit long. I like I ended up with 32 pages of notes and I really tried to run through it all. To I wanted to get it, I wanted to do it all in one sitting. So it was a little bit long. I apologize for that. But I think the lesson is indeed quite valuable. My email address is, as always, rabbiwalbejim.com. Have an amazing, happy Purim.
and you take care.